Well, good morning, everyone, and a happy Sabbath to all of you. It's good to be with you again. So this is our Sabbath school time. So this will be more of a, of a lesson-style teaching type of a presentation compared to what we did last night or what we're going to do tomorrow. But it's an important presentation. So just by way of review, for those of you who were here last night, and I think I'll get into, into it in the presentation here, is that we see that the Sunday law is the big thing that when it happens, we will know that we have reached the end of the world. And so what we're going to look at today, um, we're going to look at the four stages of the Sunday law. It's not going to be as if a Sunday law is passed and then three days later Jesus is appearing in the clouds. It's going to take a little bit of time. It's not going to take 10 years, but it's going to take a little bit of time. Just brief review for those of you who may not have come uh, before sundown last night, um, there, some of you got copies of my book. If you didn't get one, you can order one from Remnant Publications. It's a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the book of Daniel with practical applications, and you might find that to be helpful. This is a good time to be studying prophecy, and so the book of Daniel is foundational for understanding prophecy. So let's go through the stages of the Sunday Law. I'll just put them all up here. So there's four stages. And this is just giving you a preview of, of the stages as we look at them as we're going to go through them. I'm giving you references, but we'll go through them as we go through the presentation. It's going to start off where everybody's encouraged to take a rest day. Just don't work. And then it will escalate to honoring Sunday, but still worshiping on Sabbath. That's going to be the stage that probably trips up a lot of Adventists. And then the third stage is that you cannot worship on Sabbath, only on Sunday. Fines and imprisonment will be imposed for disregarding that law. And then finally, and that will be also not being able to buy or sell. And then finally, it will escalate to the death penalty. So we're going to go through that. And this is helpful to understand just because, again, when a Sunday law comes, it's not as if... Three days later, it's all over. It'll take a little bit of time for all of that to develop. Now, we read the statement last night from Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, that the final movements will be rapid ones. So it's not going to just happen in three days, but it's not going to take ten years. It's going to be fairly short order. Okay, now this is Ellen White, Great Controversy 603. She's quoting Revelation 18, which is the loud cry message. This says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, that's also great authority, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And then it skips along to... Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. We talked a little bit about the loud cry message last night in Revelation 18. And it's worth mentioning a little bit here. When the loud cry message happens, God's people are going to be filled with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Latter rain, loud cry. And the earth is going to be illuminated with the glory of God's character. And then the message is going to say, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils. What you're going to see when this happens is you're going to see the full maturity of the character of Christ in God's people which allows the earth to be illuminated with the glory of God's character because now not only is a proclamation being given, but a demonstration is seen. And there is a distinction. It's important for us to proclaim the three angels' messages. We're commanded to do so with a loud voice. But when God's people receive the outpouring of the latter rain, the world will not only hear the third angel's message, they will see it. And when they see it, and when they see that we have the character of Christ in totality, 
we will have the power to announce that the character of the devil has been fully developed within the fallen churches. And that's what the loud cry message will announce. So you will see the character of Christ, but you will also see a demonstration or a, you will see a message that announces that Babylon is fallen, that her sins have reached to heaven. And there will be a message to God's people in Babylon. <clears throat> and as I said last night, the majority of God's people are still in Babylon. And so there will be this final message for God's people to come out of her. To not receive her plagues. And so our role will be to give that message. Here's an important point. It's easy to identify the beast power in Babylon and say who it is. But it's not so easy to give that message with the Spirit of Christ. And one of the reasons why the loud cry hasn't been given yet is because the latter rain hasn't been poured out yet because God's people haven't yet been ready in totality to give that message to announce to the world that Babylon has fallen because the last thing God wants is for his people to identify the beast power with the spirit of the beast. Now we need to do it. Now some people just say, oh, we shouldn't even talk about it. That's not true. The Bible says we should. But it's important to have the spirit of God as we give that message. So I just wanted to mention that. Now, Ellen White goes on to say this, this scripture, this is a great controversy, 603. This scripture, referring to Revelation 18, points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation 14, verse 8, is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. Now, if you you don't know the history of what happened in the summer of 1844. In the summer of 1844, the Christian churches, the Protestant Christian churches at large, rejected once and for all the preaching of the Millerite movement of the soon return of Jesus. And once they did that, it was a prophetic fulfillment for the fall of Babylon a second time because the second angel's message says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. There's two falls to Babylon. The first fall was the Roman Catholic Church state power centuries ago. And during the dark ages, they persecuted God's people. They fell centuries ago. Then you have the second fall where you have the mother, mother church and then you have the daughters, the harlots, who fall with her, who continue to accept Sunday sacredness and they rejected the soon return of Jesus, that message. So they became part of Babylon in the summer of 1844. But then the loud cry message will announce that her sins have reached into heaven. So they're fallen, but then her sins have reached into heaven. And we saw what caused that last night. So here we see a terrible condition of the religious world is here described. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. So that's, of course, referring to the Sabbath commandment. The Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. The Fourth Commandment is the one that God says to remember that most of the world has forgotten. And then we see that Babylon will persecute those who hold the Sabbath to be sacred. And then notice this statement. This is Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893. The prophet says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. Again, this is quoting Revelation 18. And you go down to the end of it, and it says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, I quoted this statement last night, but I'm mentioning it again today. This is part of the loud cry message. Part of the loud cry message is that God's people are going to say, Babylon's sins have reached unto heaven. When do her sins reach unto heaven? when the law of God is finally made void by legislation then the extremity of God's people is his opportunity to show who is the governor of heaven and earth as a satanic power is stirring up the elements from beneath God will send light and power to his people that the message of truth may be proclaimed to all the world so when the Sunday law comes as we saw last night that's the prophetic catalyst that triggers the loud cry message and we will announce under the power of the latter rain through the loud cry experience that Babylon's sins have reached into heaven. So 
We're gonna t we talked about this last night. I'm going to talk about the parable of the ten virgins during church this after, or the, later this morning. So the entire church wakes up to this message of Revelation 18, to this loud cry message. The latter rain is poured out on the wise virgins. And this is what happens when the Sunday law is passed. This is Ellen White describing it in clear language that we can see. Because, you know, a lot of times we say, oh, you know, we've talked about a Sunday law since 1844, and here we are in 2020, and when's it ever going to happen? And, of course, this pandemic has, I think, kind of shaken everybody a little bit to say, wow, the world really could come to an end. This world isn't getting better, it's getting worse. Notice what Ellen White says in Great Controversy 605. Heretofore, or prior to this, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. And I will say that sometimes I hear people in the church say, oh, you're talking about end time events again, you're just an alarmist. Well, it's in the Bible. God put it there, so that's why we talk about it. Then it goes on to say, their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States. By the way, have you seen intolerance becoming an issue here in America? It's interesting, and, and by the way, you got to be careful about aligning yourselves too closely with any political party. Because you, you think that you're gaining safety by leaving the right because they're going to break the Sunday law. So you align with the left and then they start to demonstrate intolerance if you don't go along with their agenda. But then if you're aligning yourself with the right, you could be in trouble when the final crisis is. So you've got to be careful. So I'm not telling you anything about who you should be voting for. I'm just saying that intolerance can be an issue on either side. So their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. And, you know, to be honest, up until the last few years, you look at America and you're like, yeah, we know it's coming, but the climate isn't really there. Haven't you seen how the climate is changing so that this could become a possibility? I mean, it's, it's happening. Then she goes on to say, it has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But notice this, but as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. So notice, and we talked about last night how there's going to be an agitation for the Sunday law, so there's going to be natural disasters, what are considered to be judgments of God. And we talked about how this pandemic is actually a recipe for what could lead to agitation for a Sunday law. I'm not saying that this particular pandemic will definitively cause that, but there's going to be what will, events that the people of this land will say these are judgments of God. This will lead to an agitation for a Sunday law saying we've been dishonoring Sunday and God is giving us judgments because we've been dishonoring his day. And when Sunday observance becomes widely agitated, this event that has been so long doubted and disbelieved, even in this church, not the Lexington church, but the Adventist church at large, all of a sudden the third angel's message will produce an effect that it hasn't ever had before. And Adventists will begin to wake up in a way that they've never been awake. And the world around us and God's people in the other churches, as they hear the message preached, as it's empowered by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the latter rain, and as the loud cry begins to sound, they will not only hear the message, they will see a demonstration of Spirit-filled Adventists who are giving a message based on truth with the Spirit of Jesus, and many will come out of those churches and join the ranks of God's people. It will produce an effect which it could not have had before. So we're going to go through the stages of the Sunday Law, but, but I, I just want to mention before we hit that stage, now is the time for us to be preparing to be part of that loud cry experience. 
to receive the latter rain. You know, one of the reasons, too, why the latter rain hasn't been poured out, you know, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. So if we're not living obedient lives through the grace of Jesus, we're not going to receive the Holy Spirit. You see that in the book of Acts chapter 5. But, you know, pride's an issue for people, too. And if the Holy Spirit were to be poured out now on some of us, we would take the credit for the work that God does. And God is looking for humble vessels that he can fill completely with his spirit. And it's not about who gets credit for the work that God does. It's about uniting together to do the work that God wants us to do so we can be part of that. So let's look at the stages. Again, there's going to be four stages to the Sunday law, and there, there's probably some overlap, so I don't want you to necessarily come away from this saying that all of these stages fit into a real tight box, but these are the four things that are going to happen, and most likely sequentially if you look at what Ellen White says. And as you line it up with what the Bible says, so that you kind of have an idea of how it's going to progress. And we see that it will start with agitation from the leading pulpits of the land. And what will happen first is that laws will be passed that will command people to re refrain from working on Sunday. Now... You know, for us as Seventh-day Adventists right now, a lot of us don't really work on Sunday anyway. I mean, you know, sometimes I'll take call on a Sunday and go see a few patients in the hospital. Some of you may have some jobs that require you to, to work, but a lot of us have that day off anyway. Um, and it's a day of rest that will be encouraged. It will be encouraged from the standpoint of having a family day. Um, this isn't necessarily a point where you're going to receive the mark of the beast. And we're going to talk about the mark of the beast this afternoon when we do the presentation called the New World Order, which we, where we look at Revelation 13 and 17. So it's going to start off as a day of rest, a family day. And I'll also mention this, I think, in a slide or two. It'll also be for purposes of saving the environment. So a family day and an environmental day. And this is a time that we can engage in missionary labor. This is not a time where we need to defy this law to say, oh, well, we're going to set up shop and work anyway. This will actually be an opportunity to do the work that God has called us to do to warn the world of what's happening. Now, if you check out the Green Sabbath Project, for example, if you just type that into Google, go to Green Sabbath Project, this is what they say, and this, this was released during the pandemic, I believe. I might be wrong about that, but it was a recent release where they said, one day every week, do nothing. Now, they're not specifying a specific day, but it's going to be pretty easy to pick which day to do this. So, one day every week, do nothing. Take a weekly day of rest. Make it a real Sabbath for you for the earth. So this is from an environmental perspective. It's not even from a religious perspective. Don't shop, don't drive, don't build. That's what they're saying. You know, the Pope has been saying some things recently as well about how the earth needs to take a rest, that this pandemic is causing the earth to have issues. So it's interesting to see what's happening. Now again, we're not in that stage. I'm just saying a time's going to come where when it's agitated for, the first step will be for a day of rest. And Ellen White actually gives us counsel about how we can handle this time. This is Testimonies, Volume 9, 232. Dear brother, I will try to answer your question as to what you should do in the case of Sunday laws being enforced. The light given me by the Lord at a time when we were expecting just such a crisis as you seem to be approaching was that when the people were moved by a power from beneath to enforce Sunday observance, Seventh-day Adventists were to show their wisdom by refraining from their ordinary work on that day, devoting it to missionary effort. So... Um, and I don't have this in the slides, but some of you may have heard of the name of E.J. Wagner. He was a prominent preacher in the Adventist church, known for his message on righteousness by faith. Well, he moved to London, England in the 1890s, 
and he was trying to buck civil authority because there were some laws that um, actually prevented working on Sundays in that day in London and LMY told him you know stop trying to bring persecution upon yourself before it's necessary that's a day where we can engage in missionary efforts so when this law comes <clears throat> we're not going to rise up and say no keep your businesses open show that we're not going to bow to this law well we're not going to honor the day as a holy day but we can use that day where we're not doing ordinary work to do door-to-door -door work, to do missionary work, to help people, and to open to them the scriptures. And, you know, sometimes we think, hey, we're going to fill, you know, these big arenas and stadiums and give the third angel's message in front of 50,000 people. When I look at what Ellen White says about what we're going to do during this time, it looks more to me like we're going to do door-to-door -door labor where God's people all over the earth will be going door-to-door -door warning the world of what's happening. Now, if we get the 50,000 stadium, great, but who knows the way the world is now with this pandemic, you may never see 50,000 people in a stadium again. I don't know. And so, you know, time will tell, but this will be a time where we will do missionary effort. The day is being set aside <clears throat> to be used as a day of rest, as a family day, to save the planet, that kind of thing. And we as God's people will be saying, look, we have been saying for years that this day will eventually be honored, even though it's not God's day. Now is the time to come out of Babylon. So that's what we'll do during this time. Then Ellen White says this about what happens if you try to defy this particular type of Sunday law where it's just a day of rest, but you're not required to honor it. She says to defy the Sunday laws will but strengthen in their persecution the, the religious zealots who are seeking to enforce them. Give them no occasion to call you lawbreakers if they are left to reign upon men who fear neither God nor men. The reigning up will soon lose its novelty for them, and they will see that it is not consistent or convenient for them to be strict in regard to the observance of Sunday. Now, what she's talking about here too, of course, is referring to Sunday laws back Back, you know, over 100 years ago that weren't necessarily part of a national Sunday law. But this is going to be how it starts, and we don't need to bring extra persecution upon ourselves to say, well, we're going to keep working during that time. And I'm going to move forward here. Most of these quotes say similar things, but I will read this. This is Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students 551. At another time when our brethren were threatened with persecution and were questioning in regard to what they should do, I gave the same advice that I had given an answer to the question concerning the use of Sunday for games. I said, employ Sunday in doing missionary work for God. Teachers, go with your students. Take them to the homes of the people near and far and teach them how to talk in a way to do good. So again, this is an opportunity opportunity to let the world know what's happening. So that's going to be stage one. Stage one will be our, our warning. It's going to be our wake-up call. When that happens, we're like, wow, the end of the world has come. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. We're going to talk about that in our church service and we're going to do missionary work. And I don't know how long this period of time will last, probably not too long, because the Sunday law is not going to be simply for the purpose of getting people to take a day of rest. If you study Revelation 13, and we're going to look at this this afternoon in our afternoon presentation, the issue of the Sunday law and the mark of the beast is so that the entire world will worship the dragon, who is Satan, who gives us power, seat, and authority to the first beast, and then the second beast who speaks as a dragon, so they speak like Satan, all of the, they unite so that they cause the world to worship the dragon. And so simply taking it as a day of rest isn't enough for Satan. That's how he gets the ball rolling. But he's going to escalate this issue to obtain the worship of the world, so that the world will worship him. And in order for that to happen, it will not simply be a day of rest. It's going to be a day that will be honored. So a law will be passed after it's simply been a day where, hey, take a family day, don't go to work, just enjoy, you know, save the environment. Now it's going to be, you know, these judgments of God are because we have not been honoring and worshiping on Sunday. It's time to get people back into church. Now here's the ironic thing about a Sunday law, if you think about this. <clears throat> 
if you look at the gospel of Jesus Christ in scripture, the everlasting gospel, and you look at the best verse to me in scripture, now this is debatable, but to me, Romans 1, 16 and 17, describing the gospel says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But what makes the gospel so powerful? Verse 17, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So in other words, those who are justified by faith have the righteousness of God revealed in their lives. Now somehow the Christian world has taken the book of Romans to say that justification by faith is to simply have the righteousness of God declared without it being revealed. And that's not what the Bible says. So here's what happens with the Sunday law crisis. The true gospel of Jesus Christ teaches that the gospel will change your heart so that Jesus will change you. As you meet Jesus at the foot of the cross, you will be changed into the same image. You will be changed into the likeness of Jesus. The gospel of Babylon teaches that your life will become better, but that you will continue to have sin in your life. So here's what happens. <clears throat> when the Sunday law crisis hits, the church comes to the state power and says, we need your help. Because society is falling apart. And people aren't in church. And our gospel isn't powerful. Now, they're not saying this explicitly, but this is an implicit admission by the church, by the, the fallen churches when they come to the state, they are implicitly admitting that our gospel has not been powerful enough to change society. Therefore, we need a law from the state to enforce people to worship God because our gospel hasn't been good enough to change society. That's what the fallen churches are admitting when a Sunday law is passed. And God never works through coercion. The God that we serve asks us for our, our obedience out of a, a voluntary choice through our willing heart to follow the Lord. But when a Sunday law is passed and when we are required to honor a day that God hasn't even sanctioned, That is the mark of the beast. Because Satan is out to enforce worship the way he wants it to be done. And of course, we wouldn't be in favor of the state passing a national Sabbath law because we don't believe in coercion. We want people to voluntarily choose to follow God. And so, we as Seventh-day Adventists and the Three Angels' Messages have the everlasting gospel that proclaims that God will transform you so that the righteousness of God will be revealed in your lives. And Romans 1.17 is fulfilled in Revelation 18 where an angel comes down from heaven having great power. The earth is lightened with its glory because Romans 1.17 is fulfilled. The righteousness of God is revealed in the lives of God's last day people. So now not only is the third angel's message being proclaimed, it's being de- demonstrated. So you have these two polar opposites. God's people are responding to the mark of the beast crisis where the righteousness of God is revealed in their lives through the power of Jesus Christ. And the beast power is saying, we can't change society. Therefore, we're going to force you to come to church. Do you see the difference? And so this is the second stage. A lot of honor and worship on Sunday. This is a time where they will say you can still observe your Sabbath, but you have to honor Sunday as well. And this is a time that is going to trip up, unfortunately, I believe, many Seventh-day Adventists. Because if you're not connected completely to the Lord, and you've been used to living for the present life, you're going to think that you can have your cake and eat it too. I'll still go to church on Sabbath, but hey, if I go and honor Sunday, then I won't be bothered by anybody. But this is a time for us as God's people to say, we cannot honor a day that goes against God's law. 
Social pressure will increase. This is during what we call the little time of trouble once the Sunday law is passed. And by the way, this is a, the little time of trouble is a name that Adventists have, have created that even Ellen White doesn't use that term and you don't find that term in the Bible, but it's a term that we use. The little time of trouble is the period of time from when the Sunday law is passed to when probation closes. And then prob when probation closes, we enter into Jacob's time of trouble. But the little time of trouble is not really little. Because during the little time of trouble, there will actually be martyrs for the faith. After probation closes, there will no longer be martyrs, but then you'll go through the seven last plagues and Jacob's time of trouble towards the end of that, and the battle of Armageddon, and, and the mental anguish of that will be significant. But the little time of trouble is not going to be little. That's the time where we're fleeing our homes, looking to flee to the mountains, all that kind of thing. And it's not just going to be a simple little time. But social pressure is going to increase, and many will bend to the pressure of Sunday worship. This will be a time when many Seventh-day Adventists will compromise, unfortunately. Yet at the same time, others will be coming out of Babylon into God's last day church. So I would just encourage you now, don't compromise on little things now. Because if you're compromising on little things now, bending little things on how you observe Sabbath, it's not going to be any issue for you to go along with the, the large current when all the world wonders after the beast. It's going to seem so great. Everybody's getting back to God. People want to be following God. And I mean, there's going to be people who think they're doing the right thing by going along with Sunday worship. That's what's going to make it that much more difficult. So notice this. This is Great Controversy 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Notice, it's those who have not been sanctified through obedience to the, to the truth. Sanctification is important. If God isn't empowering you to live a sanctified life, you're setting yourself up to receive the mark of the beast. Notice this next sentence. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Now, let me just say this. I see some of my friends on social media who can more clearly articulate the reasons for the political party they support than they can for the third angel's message. And you're unwittingly uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit when you do that. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be paying attention to what's happening in America and what's happening in the, the current climate of society. But we're not called to take sides in this fight. We're called to take sides with the Lord. And to be ready to give the third angel's message with power, with power when, the third angels, when, when the Sunday law crisis comes. And so be careful because I'll say this. I've always long held that I don't want to be too closely united with the religious right. But I've seen some of my friends who are Seventh-day Adventists who identify themselves as Democrats. And there was a brother out in California who was a public health officer. He was the public health officer for the city of Pasadena. And he was fired from his position because of the sermons he gave in Adonis churches describing what the Bible says about homosexuality. And I'm not, I don't have time to go into the whole story. And these friends of mine who are Seventh-day Adventists are so united to the Democratic Party that they said that his firing was justified, even though his constitutional right to the free exercise of religion was clearly violated. And so be careful with how you unite, how you unite with the world and partake of its spirit on either side. Because that could cause you when this storm approaches to jump ship and say, oh, I don't want to be part of that. Now, the sad thing is people who jump into receiving the mark of the beast forget that they're jumping into receiving the seven last plagues. So you think you're saving yourself, but you're really losing your life by doing so. 
Going on, it says, men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. You know, it's going to be a difficult time when we see people who have been our friends who are speaking against us during that final crisis. It's going to be tough. We don't know who will be part of that. But if we have the spirit of Christ, we will have the spirit of Father. Forgive them for they know not what they do. So then we advance to stage three of the Sunday law. So stage two was honor Sunday, but you can still worship on Sabbath. By stage three, though, it's the law prohibits worship on Sabbath altogether. You can't honor that Sabbath day anymore. You can only honor Sunday and fines and imprisonment will be imposed, and it escalates to where you cannot buy or sell. Now, this is difficult because, you know, as, as human beings, we, are, we, we have a natural self-preservation mechanism within us where nobody in their right mind is trying to harm themselves. If harm comes your way, you jump out of, you jump out of a, if a vehicle's coming at you, you jump out of the way. If you're on the, the ledge of a, of a high cliff, you, your natural tendency is to move away from that because we all have a God-given mechanism of self-preservation. That's not a bad thing in and of itself. God wants life to be preserved. But now there's a law that is going to go against your natural senses that is saying, if you don't go along with this, you can't buy and you can't sell. Where's your food coming from? How are you going to support yourself? And it's going to be difficult if you're not used to trusting in God now. And so what I hope that you're seeing from this is now is the time to learn to trust in God through faith when the trials of life come, when the difficulties come, use these experiences to develop faith in God. Don't be like the children of Israel who every time there wasn't water or there wasn't food, they murmured and complained and said, oh God, let us out here to die. That's the natural tendency to say that, to complain. But those trials right now are helping us to be ready for what comes. So that's going to be stage three of the Sunday law. Um, now, notice this statement. This is Great Controversy 607. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. So at this point, God's people are giving the loud cry message. They're saying Babylon has fallen, her sins have reached to heaven, but Satan's pushing back. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. So there will be power attending the message that God gives us. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. So again... Because the church lacks the power of God, it has to appeal to the power, to the strong arm of civil power. You know, as God's people, we rely upon the power of God. We don't need the civil power to do our work for us. But the fallen churches will appeal to the strong arm of civil power during this time. Going on, this quote says, They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages. So you've got to think about this. You know, you're one of God's faithful Seventh-day Adventists, and they come to you and say, you know, you're, you're a good person. You've done so many good things for our community all these years, and we recognize that. And if you will just go along with this, we will give you X amount of dollars and we will give you a position in our community that will take care of everything for you. You won't have to worry about anything. And there's going to be a lot of manipulation and other inducements that will, and coercion that will cause some to renounce their faith. But we want to make sure that we stand on the Lord's side. Notice this. But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. The same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Do you, know, do you know your Bible so well 
that you will be able to stand for your faith when that time comes. Those who are arraigned before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth, and some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep all the commandments of God. Thus light will be brought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. Now, you know, I'm reminded in the book of Mark that we don't need to study ahead of time what we're going to say because the Holy Spirit will bring to our mind just what we need to say in that moment. But the point is, is that if you've never studied anything, God can't call to your mind that which you haven't studied. So you do need to know. It's just that you shouldn't have some kind of a strategy like, okay, so the first thing I'm going to say is Revelation 13, 2. And then point two will be Daniel 7, 25. And then point three will be Daniel 11, 43. No, you're not going to do that. But you need to know what Revelation 13 says and what Daniel 7 says and all of those things along with the rest of scripture, so that God can bring those truths to your mind when you're in that circumstance. And God will use that to then bring light before thousands who otherwise would not have known these truths. So then we get to stage four. So there's four stages. So we've seen stage one. It will be a day of rest for the family. Stage two will be honoring Sunday. This is when the mark of the beast crisis hits. Stage three You can't buy or sell. Fines and imprisonment will be attached. And you cannot honor Sunday. Now stage four. What is stage four? This is the death decree. Look, Satan wants total control over the whole world. And there's this small remnant that he's not gaining control over. And this reminds us of Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was wroth or enraged with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, at the very end of the world, despite everything that Satan is doing to get all of the world to wonder after the beast so that they will worship him as the dragon, as Satan, there will be the small remnant who keep the commandments of God. And I just want to say this. Be careful if you're told that you can't really keep the commandments. Because through the power of God, all things are possible to him who believes. In your weakness, you can't obey. But in the power of God, united with him, you can live an obedient life through the grace of Jesus. But if you believe... That you can't obey now. Then what's the big deal. About the day you worship at the end of the world. You see the point. If you can't obey now. Then what's the big deal about the day of worship at the end of the world. And I'm afraid that some people in the church are being set up to be deceived. Because they think that we can't really obey God completely now. And so when the final crisis hits, those who don't believe that they can really obey will be much more inclined to go along with a law that goes against the law of God because we've never been able to keep the law of God anyway is the thinking. So be careful about that. God will have a people, according to the Bible, who keep the commandments of God. It doesn't just say that in Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 14, 12 also says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. That's not metaphorical language. That's reality. There will be a people who keep the commandments of God through the power of Jesus Christ. But if we don't believe that we can keep the commandments of God, we will be a ripe target for the dragon. So he goes after the woman, God's church, And he makes war with the remnant of her seed, or the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I do have to mention this too. Revelation 19.10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's not a coincidence that the concept of obedience and the concept of the prophetic gift as manifested through the writings of Ellen G. White are under great attack in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Because those two identifying marks 
are the things that God has used to protect his people from the attacks of Satan. And if we throw either of those elements out, we are going to be run over like a freight train by the devil in the final crisis. And I don't know why you would want to throw out that which would preserve you from the attacks of Satan at the end of the world. So, with this death decree, because God has a people who keep the commandments of God, they've held fast to the testimony of Jesus. Finally, the devil says, that's it. We've got to get rid of them. And so there's a death decree. We see this in Revelation 13, 15 through 17. It says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You see this also in Daniel 11, which I'm not going to go through Daniel 11 at this point. So probation closes at the death decree. Michael stands up. So when the death decree is passed, Daniel 12, 1 happens. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. But the good news is, it then goes on to say, And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Listen, it might seem to be bad from a human perspective to be part of the remnant when these attacks hit and when the death decree is passed. But then God's people will be delivered and those who receive the mark of the beast will receive the outpouring of the seven last plagues. Now that shouldn't be your motivation for being faithful to God to avoid receiving the seven last plagues. But the good news is, is that God's people will be delivered. But there is going to be a close of probation with this death decree. This will be the beginning of Jacob's time of trouble. And after probation closes, Satan impersonates Christ. And we're going to look at that here a little bit. This is Great Controversy 604. It says, fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth uniting to war against the commandments of God will declare will decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, shall conform to the customs of the church by the observance of the false Sabbath. All who refuse compliance will be visited with civil penalty, penalties, and it will be finally declared that they are deserving of death. On the other hand, the law of God in joining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens wrath against all who transgress its precepts. And by the way, the wrath of God, without mixture, that's the seven last plagues. So those who go against God's law will receive the seven last plagues. Then it goes on to say, With the issue thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. The warning from heaven is if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. You know, it's worth mentioning here as well. So there's the contrast between those who honor Sunday and receive the mark of the beast with those who keep the commandments of God, and the, uh, therefore meaning that they honor the seventh day Sabbath. We see in Ezekiel 20 verses 12 and 20, for example, that the Sabbath is a sign that God sanctifies his people. So we say that the Sabbath is the seal of God. You know, the Sabbath being the seal of God is not simply coming to church on the right day. Now that's a good thing. I'm glad you're here today. Keep coming. This is the right day to be in church. The Sabbath is a sign that God sanctifies us. You know, Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 283, that in order for men to keep the Sabbath holy, they must themselves be holy. The Sabbath is a sign of our walk with God throughout the week. So when we are walking with the Lord throughout the week, we're thankful that we have a day where we don't have to worry about the other cares of this life that we're required to participate in in order to put food on the table and to take care of our family, that kind of thing. Sabbath is a day where we honor the Lord and we have a special day with our Lord and Savior. But when Jesus is not the Lord of your life, Sabbath simply turns into a day where you can't do the things that you really like. Because Jesus isn't Lord, 
the gods of this world are the Lord of your life. And so you don't enjoy Sabbath. It's just a day like, oh man, I can't watch the playoffs. I'm going to miss the NCAA tournament game with the Wildcats. Sorry to step on toes here. I hope they won last night. You know, and it's like you're so consumed by that that you miss the blessing of the Sabbath because you're not walking with the Lord throughout the week. And if you're walking with the Lord throughout the week, you're so thankful that you're not wound up with the cares of this world that you have time with the Lord to spend time in his word and in the spirit of prophecy, all of those things, so that when the final crisis comes, you're walking with the Lord, and there is no way that you are giving up the day that, it is a, that is a clear sign that you are faithful to your Lord and Savior. You're not giving that up for anything. But if Jesus isn't the Lord of your life, then the Sabbath has just been a day where well, I didn't really like it anyway because I couldn't do fun things and, you know, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. Well, if you're walking with the Lord, your perspective about Sabbath changes completely. And so you're going to be faithful to the Lord. So just keep that in mind. So then Satan personates Christ in the last great act of the drama. This provides um, an... an I don't have a whole lot of time to go through this, but if you look at Revelation 16, starting around verse 12, the plagues start to fall, the first plague, after probation closes. But the sixth plague is where you have three unclean spirits like frogs who seek to deceive the whole world as the river Euphrates starts to dry up. Well, the river Euphrates represents the the support of Babylon. The river Euphrates is that which supplied ancient Babylon, and the Medes and Persians diverted that river that then allowed Babylon to be destroyed. Well, the river Euphrates at the end of the world, water symbolizes people in Revelation 17, 15. When the plagues begin falling, people are going to say, I guess we're on the wrong side here with this Sunday worship thing. And so Satan has to do one last desperate thing to try to convince the world that he is still leading them on the right path. And so he will personate Christ. And I don't have time to share these statements here, but Ellen White says in certain statements that when Satan personates Christ, this is happening towards the end of Jacob's time of trouble, it will appear as if he has come in answer to their prayers for deliverance. And they will think that they are going to be delivered, but then he's like, I've changed Sabbath to Sunday. And that's his last desperate attempt to try to, to get even God's people to be deceived. So Great Controversy 624 is the crowning act, crowning act in the great drama of deception. Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth. Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the descriptions of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. And the people will say, Christ has come, Christ has come, and they will bow down and worship him. And I'm not going to read the whole statement here, but you, you get the idea. He will claim to have changed Sabbath to Sunday, and God's people cannot go along with this because it goes against what the Bible says. So... Then we see with this death decree, Great Controversy 635, when the protection of human law shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands a simultaneous movement for their destruction. As the time appointed in the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow, which will utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. And then you see that God's people scattered throughout the the world will interpose, or will cry for deliverance, and this is when God will interpose for the deliverance of his chosen. Then you see that there's going to be shouts of triumph, jeering, imprecation. Then a dense blackness will hit. This happens just before the coming of Jesus, and the angry multitudes are suddenly arrested. So let's, let's think about this, this preparation for this coming crisis. This season of distress that is before us, how are you preparing? You just kind of winging it, saying what's going to happen, just kind of hoping this pandemic comes to an end and we'll get back to, as I talked about last night, Laodicea and normality, just kind of business as usual. But are, or are you really coming closer to the Lord. It'd be ashamed after six months if your character wasn't closer to the Lord and more prepared to meet Jesus. Notice this statement from Great Controversy 621. 
the season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. A faith that will not faint though severely tried. I'm going to stop right there because this is something that I believe all of us can identify with. You know, I happen to be a physician, and I know there's other physicians here in, in the congregation this morning, but this could apply to any other line of work. But I can tell you that in my training, for example, I trained with some very fine people that were atheists and Buddhists and Hindu and Muslim, and they were very nice people when they had gotten a full night's rest and they had meals on time and all of that, and they did nice work and, and gave great care to their patients. But, you know, all of us, no matter what line of work that you're in, you're not going to have the best day of the week every day you go to work. Or if you're staying at home with the kids, whatever it may be, some days are going to be better than others. And the question is, what's your faith like when the the babies have kept you up half the night, or you've been sick and you're up half the night, or things are running late and you're hungry. You know, I can be a really nice, I mean, just I'll just say this, I could skip my devotions. I don't recommend doing this, but I could skip my devotions, and if I showed up to work, and every single patient showed up on time, and the treatment that I had provided for them from their prior visit had worked really well, and so it doesn't run over into the next patient's time. And everybody's pleasant, thanks me for how much I've helped them, and I'm off in time to have a full lunch break, and I go home on time that day where I have a full evening with my family. I wouldn't have even needed to have devotions that day to be pleasant and cheerful. Now, some people can't even do that. Shame on them. But what about your character when you didn't get enough rest because your kids kept you up? So you're tired, and you show up to work a few minutes late, and the first patient that I see runs half an hour late, so now my whole morning's shot, and I'm probably not going to get lunch. And that happens. And then I'm hungry. What's your character like now? Because the season of distress that is before us will require a faith that can endure. And by, that, by the way, that word endure is the same word as the Greek word for here is the patience of the saints. The New King James says here is the endurance of the saints. It says Jesus endured the cross. That's the same word. Can we endure weariness, delay, and hunger? You know, we can all look back to times and say, man, I didn't handle it well. Well, you know what? The Lord in his mercy brings us back over those same pathways again so that we can learn to develop the faith that we need so that rather than complaining we can praise the Lord that he is developing character in us for the final crisis it's not fun and by the way if you say oh that wasn't that bad that's not a trial a trial by definition is difficult. And by the way as well, running late and being hungry and being tired is nothing compared to some of the things people are going through when they've lost loved ones and they're dealing with cancer and tragedy and things of that nature. Those are, are real trials. But even these daily trials are teaching us how to have the faith that we need so that we won't faint those severely tried, that when we get to that crisis, we will have learned by experience how to exercise faith. The period of probation is granted to all to prepare for that time. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His victory is an evidence of the power of importunate prayer, which means that you just lay hold on to God and you won't let go. All who lay hold of God's promises as he did and be as earnest and persevering as he was will succeed as he succeeded. Isn't that a wonderful promise? 
Now while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by which his temptation asserts their power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Satan can find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. Now notice this last sentence. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. That's the experience God is calling us to have. So that's, that's the presentation for this morning. Those are the four stages of the Sunday law. God is looking for a people who will rely on him no matter what. Even if our faith is severely tried, we will prove to be faithful. This is the crisis that is just upon us. And as I said last night, and I'll say it again now, the whole thought of a Sunday law being passed and of a crisis leading to an agitation for a Sunday law definitely feels much more real today than it did a year ago. These things are going to happen. Now, I'm not making a prediction for when it's going to happen. But these things are going to happen. And God in his mercy has given us ample evidence in Scripture and in the spirit of prophecy of the experience that he can give us if we learn by faith how to hang on to him. And that we can go through this crisis. It's not impossible. It's not going to be an insurmountable obstacle to overcome. Through the grace and power of Jesus Christ, we are well able to overcome it. Let's not be like those ten spies who went into the promised land and they spied out the land. And they came back and they said, the giants are too strong. We cannot overcome that land. Let's be like Caleb and Joshua who come, came back and said, it's a goodly land. We are well able to overcome. I'm afraid that there are too many of us in the church who are so afraid of the time of trouble that we can't look past those giants to see the goodly land of heaven that God has prepared for those who love him. And God is saying, it's a good land. You are well able to overcome it. And Jesus says to the Laodicean church, to those who overcome, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. Jesus is saying, you can overcome in the same way I overcame. And the way Jesus overcame is the faith of Jesus. God is looking for people who will develop the faith that Jesus had, who will say, I know it's going to be difficult. I know it's going to be a trial. I know that I will need to have a faith that will, that will be able to endure weariness, delay, and hunger. But by the grace of Jesus, let's go up at once and possess the heavenly Canaan. Amen. Let's close this session with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to review the four stages of the Sunday law. I pray that we would be found faithful, that we would not be afraid of the coming crisis, but that we would look to Jesus to sustain us through this crisis. And I pray, Lord, that we would be sanctified through the power of God to be ready to stand. And may that day come soon. May we do all that we can in our efforts to, to let the world around us know that you are indeed coming soon. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.